Welcome back to a show within it. We we're talking off air, so there's no point in doing this glamorous intro. But Melissa, <laughs> it's nice to have you back on the show. Yeah, it's nice to be back. Thanks for having me. Have you been taking a, I've been watching your Instagram stories. Are you out and like, are you on vacation or is that just your everyday life? <laughs> Um, a little bit of both. I was on vacation. I was in Hawaii for a bit, but then I mean, living in California, sometimes I feel like I'm on a vacation all the time, you know, I'm so close to the mountains. So, and that beach. So I try to get out there and enjoy living here. I'm jealous. Cause I was seeing all that. I was like, is she on vacation? But then like, it was like for like a couple of months. And I was like, if this is her everyday <laughs> life, like I need to start a like, golfing or something. <laughs> Yeah, well, coming from Ohio, I feel like now, especially as it's getting colder in the Midwest, I'm like still you know, trying to take advantage of all the of all the good things here. And I'm just recovering from a few injuries and I have just been itching to travel and adventure and do all the fun things again. So it's I've really been trying to get outside and, and do some things. Is there anything that you want to still do left, at least in like by the time 2021 is over? I'm almost, I mean, in terms of recovery, I'm almost fully back to sport. I want to be able to play softball and volleyball again. Um, But in terms of things I want to do before 2021 is over. Um, Next week, I'm hiking Mount Whitney, which is the tallest mountain in California. So I, why? I'm why? super excited about that <laughs> because I can, <laughs> I mean, I get it, but at the same time it's like, I can also do crack, but I'm not going to, and I can, but I'm not <laughs> going to, <laughs> it was such a random, um, invitation from someone I knew a while back in undergrad and he had some pass extra passes. And I just felt like I couldn't pass up, uh, that opportunity. I've been, tr- cause I've been like kind of phase because I was like off the gym for a little bit I mean I was still going but I wasn't like a super into it and then I was just like you know what mm-hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna hit it like full force and I just started doing six hour days of cardio so I was just doing a couple of those a week I got one coming up this week I'm excited for it. but you get a couple movies going the only recommendation is do not watch the movie old with M. Night Shyamalan while you're on an elliptical machine because that I don't know if you've seen that movie no okay um there's a, a I don't want to spoil it. I'm not going to, but I'm saying is like, there's a girl in there involved with a bone disease, which made me think of, you know, Melissa, not that you have a bone disease, but just <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. the area of improvement. The when it comes biomechanics. To, yes. The physical mm-hmm, motion, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not saying you have a, a deadly illness or anything, but this, this movie, yes, <laughs> yeah. it, it was showing like, you know, what happens like, um, you know, if you break your arm, if your arm here heals wrong. Well, like this whole movie, they're on a beach and they're aging very, very fast. And it was like somebody breaks something and then it could be healed the wrong way. So it was like, it's the scariest thick part of this movie or whatever. I mean, if you just look up this, you just type in old and then hunchback scene, you're going to freak the hell out. Cause I don't, I think I'm probably uh, never. I... Yeah. Yeah. I think I would like to be able to sleep tonight. So I don't know. I live but on I a do beach and I never want to go to one again. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. I do feel when I used to do more cardio now, I tend to try to run outside. But when I used to do running on the treadmill in the gym, um, I couldn't watch really funny movies because that was always really dangerous for me. If I laughed too hard, I kind of laugh with my whole body. So I would trip and and fly off the treadmill. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I usually have people like nudge me and go, what are you watching? I'm like, why? They're like, cause your reaction is going from like horrified to laughter to horrified to laughter. I was like, I was watching a murder documentary. It was just, there's some, <laughs> there's always that one guy that's like, I saw them at the gas station and I can't stop laughing when something like that pops up. It just makes me guttural <laughs> yeah. laugh, but it, 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 yeah. it, it's been getting me dived into the world of like, obviously not only physical motion, but improvements in it as well too. And then tech kind of mm-hmm. your area, a little bit of using tech to be able to improve Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. some of these but ai for instance i'm like getting really afraid because i always thought that the fear went from building like an artificial ai that could be a robot or something to being now more about putting technology into our bodies now it's kind of going the other way again 
where we're starting to see like a lot of AI algorithms taking over in a way that I think a lot of people aren't noticing. And I think the main focus is like music, for instance, a lot of these beats and a lot of this music that gets made today is a lot of AI algorithm created music, like mm. in, uh, not mm -hmm. little Nas X is popular for using those. And I think that's a slow dip in the water of now society's going to like that perfected or that because I mean, when I was creating a new intro, because I'm going to hit a thousand soon, mm. I was making an artificial algorithm for uh, a new intro, and it would just give you a bunch of recommendations. It's this thing called Boomy, and you basically type into it, and you're like, all right, I like reggae, I like this, I like this, I want this included, I want this included, harmonica, whatever. And it'll just keep pumping out songs and generating new and new and new. Mm -hmm. And if you reject it or you accept it, chooses on what the next song is going to be. So if I reject it, it goes, okay, so you didn't like that first one. That means I got to go the complete opposite way. And you keep going until you hone out this algorithm where you get a song and you're mm -hmm. like, damn, this is really good. And I'm getting like to this point where like, if we get younger generations like myself or younger than me, like little kids that get addicted to this AI generated music, then what's the point of going back to the original hardcore craft of like Johnny Cash or the Beatles, where you would hear them sing help. And then you would hear John, uh, John McCartney go, Oh, fuck me. As he would sing help in their actual live recording, there's him saying that yeah. little blurb. And it's that natural essence that I think is going to be taken out in a way where we're now going to Facebook's algorithm or social media's algorithm that is slowly learning and adapting now to the point where people have to put it on their text. They have to capitalize certain different letters that don't need to be capitalized. Usually it's the start of a sentence. Now it's like the middle of the word. The, one of the lettering is capitalized just to beat the algorithm. How long until it advances and it catches mm. on to that? And then next, you know, us old dinosaur people are going to not be able to keep up with this algorithm that's going to be so smart. It's going to know all of our tricks and all of our mumba jumbos. Yeah, well, there's a lot to unpack there for sure. Um, actually, I had that thought about music and AI recently. And, and to your point, I feel like you're right. It does lose that that soulfulness, I think, of of what comes when you do make mistakes too. Like I, I remember taking an online class or starting an online singing class of where Christina, it was a master class by Christina Aguilera. And she said that she would do all of her recordings all in one take and include the times that she messed up or even if she felt pitchy, she would just do it all together because she felt like that was the point of music was just putting it all out there and, you know, mistakes and all. And I really like that. And she felt like that's what brought the soul to music. And so for some reason that really stuck with me. And I feel like what you're saying with having this perfected um, music and beats that we can put together and, and sort of craft from something that's built um, automatically or with technology, it definitely does lose that. And, and recently I was, I noticed this new button on Spotify, this, um, enhance playlist button where it takes the songs in your in your playlist and then it adds songs to it based on what's in the playlist and it just also made me think of like well what's stopping you know someone from paying Spotify to put their song in the enhanced playlist and sort of catering to not just our preferences but what other people want us to listen to and that to me was also really interesting to think about. Sometimes we feel like it's AI's, you know, boosting our life and, and adding to it. And it is, but to what extent is that taking away our autonomy in ways that we aren't even really noticing or thinking about? Yeah, I was thinking about this question and kind of this conversation a few weeks when I wanted to talk with you just because on the concept of I think mm -hmm. physical improvements, for instance, for people that can't do things now having the ability to do something because of a robot or some type of biomechanical enhancement is important. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I mm -hmm. think when it starts messing with your brain, we start to get into what I wouldn't yeah. really condole call brainwashing but in a form of like how long until an algorithm can just start saying like hey we need melissa we're going to need your browsing history we're going to need every single thing of your data basically without you know you'll get let's say we'll give you better so this was an actual article i read that the government or people, some certain uh, networking sites are going to be able to pay you not really like physically with cash but online credit or even helping out with your social credit by just letting them track your browsing history. 
So this becomes mm. an issue because yes, you are perfecting what someone might want to look at or what m someone might want to do, but it's the same issue with mm -hmm. algorithms is the way that they get better is by trial and error. So the worse that the more that they go on, the more they learn and next, you know, they're able to perfect certain things. Now, for instance, if they're going to start tracking your browsing history, then what do we consider domestic terrorism? What do we consider other these types of yeah. methods that these things can flag? For instance, if I look up a government project, because I'm known to be that guy that likes to dive into that type of stuff, CCP and all, then what's stopping them from looking into it and seeing, okay, he looked up Operation Paperclip. Now this is now going to be flagged because this is a government mm. thing, which is conspiracy, which is domestic terrorism in a sense, which is how they can spin it. So I'm wondering how is this going to work out in like the next couple of years, considering the fact that now it seems like it's getting ramped up more and more and more. I mean, they make a new iPhone every two years. What are, like this algorithm is getting fixed on a basis that we don't even really get to see or get to really know of right now, as we're talking, Facebook and Instagram is down. Mm. I don't know if you've noticed this a second ago, but I tried to message mm. you on Instagram. Everything says refresh, cannot connect, cannot connect, turn the phone off, check on my computer. Everything is down. So I'm, curious to like is this what mm -hmm. they would call one of their servers down maintenance type things or are we looking forward like say the algorithm is it just going to keep going and going and going until eventually it just starts to look at like hey i'm going to choose what you get to look at for instance if my google if i mm -hmm. type into something like melissa boswell on my google Am I going to get mm -hmm. your Facebook? Am I going to get your Twitter? Am I going to get your Instagram? Or am I going to get a bunch of other stuff that you were involved into, episodes of my podcast, episodes of whatever? And it's kind of basing yeah. it off of now I'm going to only show you what I know you're going to want to see necessarily might not be the thing that I'm right. looking for. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. I think there's it, – it's scary to think about in that way. And I think studying – movement too it's been really interesting to think about how we're collecting data and if we want to be able to monitor health and predict potential risk for injury or disease and and intervene in a way that's improving health well in order to do that we need a lot of data to do that and i think that's it's a hard balance to want to collect data that's able to improve our lives and improve our health, but also not be, um, invasive. I guess, putting a, invasive. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and using that data for ways that are not in, like, in, in, intentional and, and for something positive. Um, I think it's too easy now to sell data and use it in ways that are benefiting other people, larger corporations that, that, you know, it doesn't necessarily have the individual, um, in, in mind or at the front of, of their decisions. Cause I'm wondering how long, for instance, and so they're able to program an algorithm because eventually we're going to get this neural link. I think not, maybe may, not, not for a while. I don't know, depending on how fast things evolve, but eventually there's going to be something that you can maybe put on and then take off it doesn't have to be so invasive as a giant freaking surgery where they screw something into your head but in a in a sense of if now they're able to look at that algorithm that's online or all these network sites to be able to transfer that over to maybe help out with your consciousness for instance elon musk is a big push for trying to make people be able to communicate with just their thoughts rather than speaking words so you'll be able to like mind mm. think in a way if that eventually gets taken over to that, now this is all skeptical, obviously, but I'm saying would that algorithm, let's say a person tries to stop smoking, but for as long as they've had this enhancement, the algorithm knows and reacts to them smoking all the time. So eventually it's not going to know to stop doing that. So it's always going to reach for that cigarette if you got an arm implant or if you got some type of neuro implant. It's always going to reach for that thing or it's always going to keep you so you're never able to get off your addiction now. Or even if you're taking the same route to work every single day, that gets mm -hmm. logged into your head so you always remember it. How long until that memory enhancement or whatever you get that involves with some neurons in your brain only knows that path and then you can't really take these hiking journeys that you want to go on because you've never explored that before. It doesn't have that memory mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm getting real yeah, in left field now. I'm out. No, the corn. it's interesting that you say that. I think there are some. I think I think about that more on the smaller scale of things that are happening right now. Like I think about advertisements and 
if you're saying you want to quit smoking or like, what if you want to quit shopping so much, but then all you're getting are these advertisements for things that, um, that an algorithm knows that you want from your other actions. Um, or I think about a lot of the times the like advertisements that we get for unhealthy foods or behaviors that are triggering us to do these things or choose that type of food in subconscious ways um, that, yeah, we're just not necessarily aware about. And, and, and even if we are aware of it, it, it still, it has an effect on us um, without us choosing to view that or yeah, consciously make that decision. And, um, and obviously what we're speaking is yeah. not like factual stuff that's going to happen, but I was just going to try and get your opinion on a lot of this, considering that you're involved in yeah. some of this tech involving into, or, or I guess organic material, which would be us. But I look at the concept of like, if we let people, our natural thoughts, we let people rent our own headspace. We think about things that we possibly shouldn't be thinking about, such as ex-relationships, such mm. as problems that are happening at work, such as issues with bills. How long until an advertiser can rent your headspace by just subliminally putting stuff into your head, not only with the pictures and stuff that they do on the TV or billboards or whatever, but now with this algorithm that is now into your brain. I mean, mm -hmm. McDonald's mm -hmm. just had the biggest thing where they lost a bunch of data because some person broke into their thing and sent a bunch of their private mm -hmm. data away to other people. That means employees data. That means recipes. That means whatever that got sent to a different server. I mean, the concept of how far off until this brain thing, because Tesla cars, for instance, they used to be like rare. You'd be like, that's a, is that electric car? And then now it's kind <laughs> of like there was one yeah. at a gas pump. Now there's a lot more than just one. And now it's becoming a more common thing that conditioning starts to happen. How long until the conditioning of a chip or how long until the conditioning of, you know, your watch, for instance, there's a guy that has a watch when he gets out of his car, his headlights will detach from his car and fly above and light up the pathway as he walks up into his house. So he doesn't have to turn any lights on or trip or fall. Then it goes back into his mm -hmm. car. How long until that's a common normal thing? And then eventually that thing's not going to be just a wristwatch. It's going to be farther than that. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about this the last week. We had a researcher on our, on our podcast that developed a wrist warning sensor where it can detect hand gestures. And so his vision is, you know, you could just flick your wrist and the light turns on or shut your curtain and, and things like that, just from where you wouldn't have to talk anymore. Um, this idea that you're bringing up of, our thoughts being read is really interesting and also scary. And I think it, it's scary too, because the things that sometimes pop into your head aren't necessarily the things that the thoughts that you want to be thinking, or, you know, there's this pause when you become aware of your thoughts that you're, you're able to change your thinking or change how filter it. Right. And if it's sort of your raw unfiltered thoughts, um, that, yeah, that would be terrifying. Yeah, put her on a list because for I don't being a murderer. Silly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. From having conversation with someone, you know, the things that I'm thinking are not necessarily the things that I'm I'm putting out to that conversation. And so um, just the idea of that being monitored. Yeah, I haven't. I guess thing, it feels so far off from that, that I haven't really considered what that would actually look like. But starting to think about that is is pretty scary yeah. and things like a runner's high or things like sexual lust would just completely override this fucking thing in your head because it, it's never seen that type of chemical hormonal dump in <laughs> one session before it's used to the basic bland you that's kind of like normal functioning able to like walk out into the street and you know look both ways but when you're coming off of a runner's high or when you're revved up you don't know what the hell you're even thinking you're more acting in a sense so maybe this thing would just fry or do whatever but tiktok for instance the reason it was going to be banned when it was first like over here was because a lot of its data on its servers was sent to china eventually it became only our data servers not so now it's not getting sent over there. that's why india banned it also with clubhouse a lot of people don't know when you join clubhouse those clubhouse things are still linked in with china so all your data is being sent to their servers this is how they listen in on you now we have things that do that over there too, but China has a very strict governmental policy of none of that, those types of apps. That's why YouTube is banned in China. That's why all these things are banned in China because of a concept of they're going to track or trying to track their data as well too and get their information. Now, Mark Zuckerberg, he's recently in a lot of crap because 
I think people thought that as using Facebook, you were a consumer, which is how it was sold. It turns out you're the product. Mm -hmm. Mark Zuckerberg mm -hmm. has been selling people's private data and a lot of their private information to other companies for targeting reasons. And he's been getting a lot of money from that. Now, if Mark Zuckerberg mm -hmm. does that, I don't think it's just him. I think it's any company that sees a dollar dollar bill sign will easily sell your data on a concept of they don't know who you are. So there's nothing stopping them from making money off of your private information. And that's only going to expand farther if we can't even handle that on the basic realms of the internet. Right, right. I mean, there's definitely a lot of policy that needs to come with the, it, the development of new technology. But it, it's also hard because that policy is informed by a, a select number of people too that can be paid and yeah you know yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah we definitely have to be and I don't know like what the answer for that is or you know what, what actually is going to be possible in the upcoming years like sometimes it, it does seem really I think exciting the potential even like day-to-day -day things if there's an algorithm that can look at my schedule and pick out my clothes for me. That's one less thing I need to like think about and worry about. Or if we can develop an algorithm that can see how you get up from a chair and predict if you're likely to have a fall that day or predict if you're maybe at risk for having a heart attack that day or that week. You know, these things I think have real potential to improve our lives, but at what cost I think is you know something that we have to and I and I like the role that you play it's sort of the devil's advocate it's like okay if we get this this other thing you know could happen or the data could be used in this negative way and I think having those conversations and really thinking through the ways that it could be used for bad um, or evil that's you know something that we have to do to protect ourselves and and develop policy surrounding or that it's more of an unnecessary evil or more of an unkind of intentional evil when you're selling data because it's not there's not mm -hmm. really you know a lot of people don't even know what data is to be 100 percent honest with you they hear the words mm -hmm. and they think it's their information but they don't know how deep and how far that goes that could mean that your number could be put on multiple different servers where you're getting a text message every day from a random number like me that says like hey would you like to try this and i'm like no why is this spam call hitting my number it's very yeah. very strange <laughs> or it could be as far as yeah. checking your listing and making sure you're not a threat to domestic or whatever it could be foreign or national mm -hmm. abroad and I think there's important parts that that's how it's kind of going to get it slid under. Now, I have thought of the benefits. For instance, the reason why those diabetics have a little sensor on the back of their arm that distributes insulin whenever they need it and they could do that right from their phone. That's amazing. Yeah. But at the same yeah. time, you can't be swayed by the benefits of things too. You have to ask the questions of how far this is going to go. So you'll be able to regulate it because I believe like for cars, for instance, you got to, you have certain cars that can drive on certain lanes. You have emergency vehicles. We all have a rule of the road as we drive. That means you need to have a rule of these electronics as they get established. And we need to abide by those rules mm -hmm. and also keep um, upgrading and moving them along as more people are able to cheat and hack the system. And sadly, Every system that has ever been created has a flaw to it, and that's going to be mm -hmm. very strange if you have an algorithm created system that is able to just run and do whatever. Because how many people are going to do something without letting other people know they're doing it just on the sense it's illegal? What? They're going to do it if it's illegal anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's that's so true. I think there's always that risk, but yeah, I... I don't know. I feel like I have this faith and optimism that we can do the good things and find ways to um, think through what you're saying, whether it's intentional or not intentional, you know, the ways that that using our data can can go wrong. Um, it's yeah, it's dangerous, but it also has the potential for a lot of good. So I think it's worth evaluating that the the risk and risk versus reward, I guess, of, of that. Or even having a system set up where a 
person with schizophrenia, whenever their schizophrenia arises, that could be a chemical dump or some type of medicine that gets distributed mm -hmm. to certain parts of where they need it to be able to. I look at it more of like a systematic function that's temporary, where if you have maybe fix an MRI machine, they're not comfortable at all and they make a lot of noise and they seem very old for the type mm -hmm. of technology we deal with today. So maybe if we can find better ways to upgrade the equipment that we have. It may, might not be ease of access. A lot of people might have to go to certain places to be able to do so, but there's still a lot of benefits when it comes to an aspect of like um, my nephew, for instance, has um, a form of cancer and he's going to have mm -hmm. part of his leg, um, part of his, they caught it early, but part of his leg is going to have to be taken off and they're going to have to put not like mm. taken off, like popped off more like they're going to have to cut a good chunk of his calf out. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're, we don't know what's going to happen with that. If he wants to end up getting like, I don't, I have no clue what he could possibly get at this point. Cause it's still kind of brand new, but this is stuff mm. where my brain starts to go in the positive way of maybe getting some type of biomechanical tissue or some type of thing that you can be able to place over and then graft skin on top of it. So it looks normal, but he's going to have to get metal implants or a metal, I guess it's a metal bracket or something. He's got to get something metal in mm -hmm. his leg. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, if you can mm -hmm. do that and then skin graft tissue on top of that, what's to stop technology from going a little bit farther and finding ways to maybe make sure that it's more, not only just on the sense of comfort, because we all know someone who has some type of implant or some type of thing that's, I got a metal stud or whatever in my shoulder all these people that have this thing, when you ask them, all right, move your shoulder, they can't move it like a normal shoulder. So maybe a way to perfect that to make it easier. So it's still normal. So you don't feel like you're less of a person because you got a real original piece taken out of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great use of technology is helping people be as mobile as they want in order to achieve the goals that they want to achieve and as you're talking about um you know predicting what was the example oh, like schizophrenia um when there might be a schizophrenic episode those things like to that's really exciting to me and I think as you're talking about MRI machines too something that's exciting to me is computer vision which we can where we can learn what an MRI machine is learning from large amounts of data and be able to predict that from things that are less invasive, like just a video of somebody moving. Um, for example, right now you need an MRI to predict whether or not somebody has osteoarthritis where a cartilage and their joint is breaking down. But there are certain movement patterns that are related to a person having osteoarthritis, which right now require a biomechanics lab and force plates, and then also getting MRIs at the same time. But if we can train algorithms to be able to just predict diseases like that from just a, a simple video of somebody walking or um, doing some sort of functional task like a squat, um, then we're able to improve access to healthcare and have more affordable health care for people where you wouldn't need the MRI machine, you wouldn't need to, to have um, exposure to that type of radiation. And then and I'm really excited too about mental, being able to do that for mental health. So can you predict, you know, if a person's going to have a really depressive episode or um, some other mental health um, crisis and then provide intervention to them before something tra tragic occurs and, and be able to use the data that we're collecting for um, either health monitoring, predicting health, um, but just generally improving um, access and um, affordability of healthcare. So I get scared on that too. I think I saw my nephew. I meant to say my little cousin. Um, mm. he, so he's 16. So that's little because he's younger than me. But he's on his first round of chemo. And I start to wonder like if you have some type of enhancement or some type of thing where you're able to not just give them drugs, for instance, but be able to find a way to be able mm -hmm. to kind of distort his reality in a way to where it's more positive rather than negative. And if anything, slowly decrease the reality to a sense to where he can normalize with many, maybe any changes that happen. Cause mm -hmm. I just could not imagine waking up one day after a surgery and a piece of you gone, you know, you're going to have to slowly mm -hmm. get released into that mm -hmm. or slowly work your way into that. Now, 
I, I start to get scared there too, because what stops people from just using other ways to be able to warp their reality? I mean, we all look at different things and different sources of information to be able to warp our reality. And that's one of my biggest issues with algorithms is if you believe mm -hmm. a certain thing, you're not going to be able to look and find anything else, but that type of swayed opinion or thing. I mean, there's people out right. there that I just saw this recently have a fucking bobblehead of Anthony Fauci. Now, any normal person or anything will be like, that's fucking nuts. But this person's like, I pray to him at dinner. And I'm like, good fucking yeah. luck. That's a different, but all they see is everything. That's all the articles saying all this good stuff, not all these stuff that's come out about like lying and all this other type of stuff. So you're not seeing the truth. Mm -hmm. So now their reality has been warped. So that's my reality might be warped in uh, other stuff as well, too. I think mm -hmm. I, this idea that some people are sheep and some people are not, we're all fucking sheep. But in an aspect of, mm -hmm. I think that whatever you're choosing to view or whatever you're choosing to look for, it's kind of like when you get your computer yeah. the first time, all your computer, the very first time is going to try and base stuff off what, you know, but everything's still kind of fresh. So you can go in any direction, but then it's like, does it go good or does it go bad? Does it go left or does it go right? And that's kind of the issue is with these algorithms is I feel like it's important to sense out and help you find things quicker, but are you willing to try and find things quicker at the risk that it's going to completely twist you and make you into a side that you necessarily might not a hundred percent agree with? You know what I'm saying? Mm hmm. Yeah, I think this is really something that's come out a lot in the past few years. And I think is a huge issue, because anyone can write anything and post it online and be an article of some sort. And if you're searching for a specific argument and a specific side to the argument, then yeah, you're more likely to be presented with information that's going to support that. And like you're saying, then I think it just further, it's just catering to some opinion that you have and further um, embedding that. And yeah, that's a, that's a problem <laughs> because then we're not really well-informed people presented with different sides of, of arguments. And I think a more round, more, yeah, well-rounded information or accurate sometimes it's not even accurate information that we're given but because it's supporting you know an opinion then we want to believe that it's true and so yeah i think there's that's also yeah it's, it's just another so, it's can so, of worms there yeah it's just so funky because even if we don't have a neurochip into our head for instance if a person has been smoking cigarettes for a while and they've been ordering their cigarettes online then they decide to stop smoking cigarettes they get on their device and all their ads are showing them cigarette ads mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. even if you're talking about i wish i could have a cigarette your phone's going to show you a cigarette yeah. Well, this has become a part where now bots online, these bot accounts that don't really, they just repost and repost. They're not real people, but they're part of an yeah. algorithm because a certain company can type in a certain code and create an account and profile that can be able to be a self-sustaining AI. Right. So right. I, I yeah. <laughs> I think that's fair. I think it can be scary. Definitely. And I definitely don't have the solutions to that, but I think it's worth everyone having an awareness of, of that. And so that we can, yeah, I mean, I said this before, but with policy, it's, you know, knowing the people that we're putting in office and their views on that too, and, and what their plans are to do. Like, I think we can, we should really be, mindful of that and, and have an awareness of how our data is being used and and make sure that we're also electing people that have our best interests in mind when it comes to how our data is being used. Well, a lot of my opening to this kind of happened when I was listening to an ex-CIA agent on Joe Rogan's podcast called Mike Baker. I've mentioned him a few times. He mostly talks about a lot of the, the government propaganda and these types of tools that other institutions use to be able to kind of sway the opinion of certain young generations or older generations, depending on whatever they want to show you. But he was talking about how wars are going to start to be fought. 
And he's now doing a documentary mm-hmm. for the sci-fi series talking about aliens and UFOs. A lot of these lights in the sky that people talk about seeing actually might be some type of government equipment that he was going into depth on, which are these drones. Now he's talking about these drones and he showed a video of it. He had a wristwatch, tapped his wristwatch and a thousand of these things, the size of bees just flew around behind him and were swarming in a giant hive type thing. And I'm looking at that like, is this fucking like CGI? He goes, no, these are real like mm-hmm. government tech that they're going to release in like within like the next year or so that they're going to start trying to implement for military purposes, whether it's drone or recon missions. But how long until this, which he talks about, is eventually going to sway into where we're not going to need people to fight wars anymore, which is good. We don't want people to die. But in the bad part is, is now you're willing to go to war more because you don't have to worry about losing a life because sadly, a robot life is different from a human life. So when you look at that concept means you're going to be more frugal with the invention. So which means you're just going to be fighting whoever the hell you want to fight. And then at that point, it's like humans are going to be obsolete. You can't go back from robots to humans. Yeah. I mean, I guess on the other hand of that, it's not like, even if you have robots fighting the war, it's not like humans aren't at risk. Like if you, if your country is going to war, there's obviously somebody fighting back whose intention is to also, you know, harm the humans on your side. So, um, yeah, but if someone dies yeah, compared I, to a robot. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I think in terms of like the actual fighting, yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm hitting with it's, some tough stuff because this has it's been scary. It's yeah. been on my mind so fucking much. I can't, mm-hmm. I don't have anybody I can talk to about this besides my other friend who just ramps me up even more. And I'm <laughs> like, damn it. Yeah, I think you could just keep digging a deeper and deeper hole in, I think, creating more and more anxieties. I, I guess. Sometimes I feel like too, though, people say, oh yeah, the government's going to be releasing this in like a year. And, and to me, like, sometimes I think that information is, I don't know, it's hard to believe that it's that soon. I think being around technology in a research setting and then seeing technology that's coming out in industry is also very different. Like I think a lot of times technology makes claims that it can do things that it can't yet do. Um, And I think that's also dangerous. Um, And I think it's something that if you don't work directly with that technology and are kind of working with it in the developing stages and research, you don't really realize that a lot of the claims that tech is making right now aren't necessarily um i guess living up to what they're saying they can do the biggest thing he was talking that makes about sense. was i always talked about space colonization when are we gonna be able to colonize mm-hmm. on space i had a couple astrophysics friends and astronomy friends that were talking about like it's probably predictable within the next 50 years or so now that they're taking like spacex is taking casual civilian flights up there But then when I was listening to his Mm. podcast, he says, space is not colonization anymore. It's more about warfare. And it's like, what do you mean warfare? He goes, well, there's satellites that are constantly trying to steal data from other satellites, depending on what country you're from. He goes, do you think how long it's going to be until they can modify their satellites, send something up there and be able to project and just scan and get information off your cell phone right in the country that it's aimed at? Or eventually your country is going to have to install these little drones for protection purposes, where it's going to have to start making some type of Wi-Fi canceling or EMP small magnetic frequency that can stop these signals from hitting the planet. And I'm sitting here like, fuck man like i don't can i get the fact like paying bills down properly and then we can talk about this shit but then it's like no this is happening now and i'm like it gets i've heard way too many people now talk about they want to go back before there was the internet and i i understand Mm -hmm. their reasoning behind it mostly with social networking and media has now become more divisive and more kind of like attack and defend than anything and a lot of corners of it maybe necessarily not might be for your profile but everything has become divisive towards politics a lot Mm -hmm. on twitter so and i've seen friends like smart people like yourself that have deleted their twitters on a concept of they just can't deal with the criticisms they can't deal with the type Mm -hmm. of fighting that's on it and i don't 
I, I don't want tech to go back, but also I think the major kind of incorporations to where we should be focusing our area of research on tech shouldn't be for the marketable, should be more for the, I guess, beneficial aspect of humankind, which is improving kind of certain areas that neglect you or might make you less of a person, even though necessarily mm -hmm. you're not like roads, for instance, mm -hmm. how come we don't have a road that can charge up your car as it drives on it rather a concept of reaching to a charging station or mm -hmm. you know, subtle mm -hmm. things like this where water, for instance, we can find little microbes that can be able to clean out salt from the water so we can stop having California go through droughts. You know, there's a type of thing where you start to realize like it were we're improving in a lot of explorational ways when it comes to internet or tech or social media. But I start to wonder when Instagram and Facebook start going down, how many people are going to another site or checking the internet to check those servers out. And then they're data mining to see how many people are addicted to these social media sites where they keep refreshing and refreshing. Hell, before this podcast, I was refreshing like 50 times to see if my message went through. So I just ended up texting you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, I think, too. I think the fact that you're listening to, you know, someone talk about these, I feel like in part, it's like his, I forget the name of the guy that you're talking about, but that's talking about this, but like Mike his Baker. job, Mike Baker, is to kind of give a hot take on this, right? And like get people riled up and freaked out. And like, that's like, in some, some ways, I think that it's not just like the information they're giving, but you know, they're expanding it a little bit to really get people freaked out. And I'm sometimes question, you know, how much of that is speculative versus like what is actually happening and what is more like, this is a hot take and it's getting a lot of attention and getting people freaked out. And then I think of what, like, it, does he, you know, not use a cell phone then, or like what, you know, if you're saying that we're at this like huge risk for all of these things, like then I would expect, like, if you really believe that that was happening, like right now in the world, like you wouldn't use technology in your life. That's, that's what I thought too. Um, I've been trying to limit my social media, but when I listen to a podcast yeah. like his, his whole thing was that it somehow got taken to the point where people are more uh, against, I guess, um, domestic attacks from their government rather than looking at the foreign actions. So more people are criti criticizing mm -hmm. the fact that the CIA or NSA, for instance, are spying mm -hmm. on them rather than looking at how another country is doing it the same way, just through an app or something mm -hmm. that they use, which he was highlighting. Now he's working for NSA right now, but he's ex CIA. Mm -hmm. He has strong opinions against Snowden. Now, a lot of people consider Snowden a conspiracy, but Snowden is a person that released a lot of these things that led up into the documentary, like social dilemma, where it showed the NSA and all these yeah. corporations were data mining you. What he did was illegal. But for good purposes, Mike Baker doesn't think it was for good purposes. Mike Baker thinks it just caused mm. more fighting and riling up against the government to look at the scrutiny upon what every government is doing to their people. Basically, it's just monitoring them. I, I don't like, mm. for instance, the UAP report that came out during covid. That was just a bunch of people that got super interested into it to a point where they had a petition signed and all this stuff signed where they got the government to talk about it. But they had talked about it years ago. I mean, when Reagan was president, was it was mentioned. And then people just forgot about it. And he goes, do you really think that there was a national threat like that or some type of global threat like that? And they just stopped looking into it. That's a global risk. No, they kept looking into it, but people stopped caring. Same thing with the social dilemma. Mm. People cared for the first two weeks it came out. Then they stopped caring because now we've kind of all agreed you're using the device. You might as well just let them track you or do whatever. We don't even know what that means. So it's like, how normalized are you getting to it? That's what they're doing is slowly releasing things that are helping you get normalized to mm -hmm. these situations. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that, that could, you're looking at me like I'm nuts. Sure. Yeah. No, I'm just trying to take it all in. Um, because I think it's, uh, it's can be overwhelming when you think of it that way, or like think about the potential for that to be happening. 
I just, um, I, I, I'm trying, yeah. I try and get my hands in so many different realms that I can't believe I've completely missed this one because this seems so much mm-hmm. like Terminator that it's impossible. And then they're like, no, this is like tech that's actually happening. Now I knew a long time ago, they made a robot called Eater. It was made by DARPA and it was supposed to survive off eating dead decomposing tissue. So you would release these mm-hmm. things into battle or war and it would just eat the mm. dead bodies because someone's got to take care of the dead bodies. Bodies, they don't just leave them there. They have to do something with them. So this robot was supposed to eat tissue. You can look it up. It's E A T R, and it was it's scary shit because they painted it mm. playground colors like a child's swing set. And I'm <laughs> over here like, man, what's the next thing gonna be? We're gonna have some type of technology. I mean, we, there was an Apple Watch, and then we all got used to that. Now a lot of people have Apple watches, but then. What's after that? Now we have a phone that's as big as an iPhone, but you can flip it and it turns into like a laptop in your hands. You can control your car from it. You control your lights from it. What's the next Mm -hmm. thing where I'm like, can we just take it off of the marketing aspect of making this thing that's supposed to be a, you know, not really a, um, I guess it would be a delicacy. Now it's more of a requirement. I'm like, can we get that into a beneficial way where someone who's lost their sight or someone who's lost their hearing can have a way to be able Mm -hmm. to communicate or be able to use that function again to a more beneficial way of society where maybe we can fix mental health. If anything, I'm Mm -hmm. okay with if they just project stars up into the sky, because right now, if you look out at night, you'll see some depending on where you're located in the world. But Mm -hmm. a lot of it has been blocked out because we like lights in our house. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I like what you're saying with being able to be able to use technology to do to do good. And I think there yeah, is so much potential for that. And I think when you're talking about the environment too, I think that's another area that I'm really excited to see how technology can can help us sort of go back because I think this initial boom in and in industrialization and building technologies then was is having this really negative impact on our environment um, but hoping that as technology is continuing to improve we can start to reverse some of that um, that we didn't necessarily even know that was happening and I think that's sort of the problem with all of the new technologies is that we're developing these things because we think it's making our life easier. And in some ways it probably is um, in the short term, but then there's so many different consequences because of that. And we can't really under fully understand the consequences that will come of it until we're already living that. Um, I think with technology in terms of like cell phones and social media, we're thinking about mental health in terms of like the food industry and industrialization and um, like agriculture, we're learning the detrimental effects on the environment. And now it's like, okay, how do we use technology to not just make our lives easier, like in the short term, like that can't be our goal anymore because it's not sustainable, but how do we improve our lives while making it something that's sustainable and, and, and remembering, I think that we're connected to the world in a larger way. And then, you know, just being here and living on it. And I think um, this also kind of going back, I feel like there are so many things that are sort of circling back in, in our lives. And I think we're circling back to sort of this bigger focus on like mindfulness and connection um, well, the, the between internet people and between the world. Yeah. The internet shouldn't have been made a safe place because what happened mm. was, is you can't reduce Um, You can't make the world safe and you've made the internet Mm -hmm. safe. So now people don't like going out into the world. They prefer the safe spot, which is now the internet. It now fits Mm -hmm. whatever narrative Mm -hmm. or whoever bases that algorithm. Twitter's algorithm does not agree with me because I have some views that the Twitter owner of CEO or whatever loves Biden. So anything that becomes a Biden thing, I'm like, well, what about the people chanting fuck Biden? No, they said to the go Brandon. I was like, that's not what they said. But you can't find that because Twitter doesn't like that because the main owner of Twitter doesn't want that up on his site that's good for him let him do it then but you've made the internet Mm -hmm. so safe 
by these algorithms and these guards that the world isn't like that. So more people want to stay where it's safe rather than the world. So you have to cut off all algorithms or all safety mm -hmm. measures on social media and let people realize the toxicity. And a lot of people do see it even now because the algorithm isn't that good at being able to stop it all. They notice the frustrations with it where people are starting to go out and have some sunlight and go like this. You shouldn't have a president tell you go outside. You shouldn't have anybody telling you to go get vitamin D. You know, for instance, going out and going hiking or going hang with your friends. Nothing beats that fucking moment. That's outside mm -hmm. stuff that needs to be perfected and better and easier for a lot of people. You can make a wheelchair mm -hmm. accessible ramp up a mountain or you can make a wheelchair accessible ramp up a business. Then you should be able to find methods to help the environment grow or find other ways that can make it grow a little bit easier or faster in situations where you've completely decimated the area. So you can help out on the biggest issue possible without putting something into your head. And that's mental health. And the sky can do that for mm -hmm. you. Water can do that for you. Just the sun can do that for you. Yeah. Yeah. In so many ways, it's just like the, there's the simplest solution um, and, and the easy, yeah. And sometimes technology just makes everything more complicated than it needs to be. And I think convinces us that we need so many other things to be happy and to live a fulfilling life than sort of the more basic fundamental things that make us human. And when we miss those, there's nothing that technology can do to fix that for us or give us that in our lives. And those are the things you're saying, like going outside, being around people, you know, being in nature and kind of just having that awe and wonder and fascination for, for life and for what's around us. Do you think that a lot of this stuff that goes on online might entice people more or scare people more? Cause there's a giant push for, I don't know how you feel about biohacking, which is like mm. not just biomechanics, but also people that are trying to naturally hack their way that their brain and mind and their body react to things by like mm -hmm. meditation is technically included in that as well, too. I think that's mm. important to do it naturally as well, too. But I'm wondering if that's going to deter a lot of people off the path of wanting to enhance themselves with technology and more on the concept of just enhance their lives a little bit with just making your refrigerator speak or sing ice ice baby when you get a crushed ice from it. <laughs> yeah, I think this is going back to the idea that people want a solution that's easiest and like the lowest energy in the short term. And I've heard, for example, like pills that are supposed to give you the same effect as a runner's high um, or gotta you know, earn things it. that- Gotta earn yeah, it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and, and I, I, gen, like, I don't believe that it, technology or anything that we produce synthetically can actually do all of the things, all like give us all of the benefits that, that doing those things ourselves like can do and like there's also you know a lot of different side effects that again we won't know about until people start trying these things that are supposed to be you know whether it's yeah, for biohacking yeah I it, it really freaks me out to be honest and it's like I just don't feel like there's any good that comes in shortcutting things and doing things that aren't yeah if there's a way that we can do it naturally um I also find that like a lot of times in putting the effort into like doing these things that are good for us, like it also helps us slow down. And to me, if like, I just take a pill to do all the things like, you know, meditating and journaling and exercising and eating well. And if there's just like a pill that does all of that, then like, so that we have more time to do what, like work or, you know, yeah. it's like, those are, those are the joys in life. Like, those can be joyful and I think fulfilling in itself. And so like just by the act of doing it and taking all of that away, is just um, to me, it doesn't, yeah, seem like it will be for the betterment of society. 
I look at it like, yeah, a lot of people are rushing or trying to cut their life, make it easier. And it's like, for what? And then most mm -hmm. of the time they, they just sit there bored or on their phone. So it's like, you just took, yeah. it, so you made something do the chores for you easier, but then you're on your phone or you're just going and doing nothing. It's like, does it make sense yeah. to just do it yourself and save the money? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think there are times where there are little things that add value to your, like if, if someone can, if you can have your chores done for you and that means you get to spend more time with your kids or that means then you have time to go outside and, and, and enjoy nature and enjoy moving your body, then like, I think that's a great, you know, use of technology or automating things or adding to your life in that way. But yeah, when it's taking, I think the, the things that make us people away from our lives and that's, you're supposed to cry story. over relationships. You're supposed to think about something you yes. did in the eighth grade or seventh grade in the middle of the night when you're supposed to be sleeping. <laughs> These are important features you can't take away. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and I, yeah, I think that's such a good point. Is yeah, I think circling back to like yeah, the thoughts that we have and that we think of thoughts for a reason, and it, you know, having that awareness, and I think it helps us learn about ourselves. And that's one of the most exciting things about life is learning about ourselves, being able to reflect on who we were previously, who we are now, who we want to be, and having that be sacred to us, and and that's like our own you know, identity or yeah, who we are and not having that be given to, to someone else There's or two, in someone else's hands. There's two things. There's one is that everyone is afraid of death, but everyone wants to sleep. And then there's the second one, which is everyone hates pain, but pain is where you see the most growth. Mm. Yeah. I really like both of those. So I'm, I appreciate you for giving me your time, Melissa. It was amazing talking to you again. I'd like to have you back on in the thousand episodes when I get there. Um, but it's been uh, that's exciting. It's it's been a pleasure. Is there anywhere people can find you? Any of uh, links you want to say? Yeah, sure. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Melissa Boswell underscore. So you can find me there. I also, um, yeah, I, I am a researcher, so. My research is on LinkedIn and ResearchGate and those types of um, outlets that are more focused on the science. And anything positive to our listeners out there who are hopefully still tuning in and not thinking about jumping off of a lake? Or <laughs> a cliff? Anything positive? Um, I think that is like what is positive about all the positive things that are going on. You know, and I have to repeat and... that real quick because uh, oh, your connection cut okay. out right when the positive thing came in. I was like, don't, <laughs> the algorithm doesn't like it. No, <laughs> no, I was just going to say, I don't necessarily know that I have something, you know, specific to say, I guess, in terms of positivity of just taking a moment to think about what's positive in your own life to me um, is something that I've been trying to work on and, and do. do more frequently. And I think sometimes when we're talking about these scary things, it's easy to sort of spiral and think about, you know, all the scary things that could happen, but kind of grounding yourself in, in the present and, and what's good right now um, is, yeah, always a nice reminder of how, how good the world is and, and our life can be. So I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And ended on that, but I appreciate you for doing okay. the podcast and thanks for listening. Yeah.